I feel the chlorophyll plants reaching for the sun, just like our spiritual heart and mind reaching for the light, reaching up for the light, if you look at it that way. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful day. Every day is a beautiful day on this side of the grass, as they say. But if you're young, you don't necessarily want to hear that, and I didn't either. Zorba the Buddha, Imaho. Follow your joy path. It's all good. <laughs> Let there be more light than there was. There is. Hi, everybody, and good morning. Welcome to our town hall public meditation. I love getting together with everybody on Sundays, and this is a good time to do it during the COVID winter and the COVID winter of our heart of this year, with half a million Americans dead from COVID and countless others around the globe. Let's keep that in mind, that we're the fortunate ones and the lucky ones, and keep a perspective on things. But even when we can get together like this and be together like this, it's, it's beautiful. America the beautiful. American Buddhas, throw off your chains, your discursivity, your hang-ups, and live the enlightened life, the awakeful life, the mindful life, the principled life, whatever you call it. The experience of the life itself is even sweeter. Right your ship. When I become clearer, everything becomes clearer. It's a universal law beyond any ism, beyond schisms or partisanship. Partisanship, which most of us have come to abhor in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, and it's such a hang up in getting anything done in the democratic process also shows up in the self and other relations and you know, are thinking others are different than themselves and are competing in our greed and aversion and wanting things to be other than they are in the subject object relation not just self and other with people but with everything all things all our projections and interpretations liking and disliking. That's why Buddhists say there is no unequivocal good or bad. There's only the wanted and the unwanted. That's a steep koan to contemplate, a steep conundrum. But everything is so subjective and subject to our interpretations and our own worldview, seen through our own lenses our own states of mind or mood, our own nurture and nature, both, which is karma in Sanskrit, causation or the cycle of conditioning, the unenlightened life, whatever you call it, samsara, karma, the wheel of conditioning, cause and effect. So it's up to us to look into what's connected to what, and to adjust accordingly, we can't control the winds, but we can learn to sail and navigate better, not just be blown away by them in whatever direction. The group karma, the species karma, the global karma happens to be blowing in. That's the secret of self-mastery, of inherent freedom of being. Getting our hands on the steering wheel, our hands on the tiller, so we can sail and navigate better regardless of the winds. So we can awaken from the trance-like, semi-conscious sleepwalking most of us call life, especially if we're in some way or other intoxicated, not even just our normal semi-consciousness, so distracted, so scattered or fractured. But adding things to cause heedlessness, as Buddha called it, intoxicants, as we call it on top of the mix of semi-conscious sleepwalking or dreamwalking, staggering forward on the treadmill of conditioning under the weight of our conditioning, 
and not knowing how to step off even for a moment and look around and reassess and see where we're at. And if we want to keep going in that direction, you know, we might be climbing the ladder of success in our minds, but is the ladder leaning on the right wall? When did we decide that was a ladder of success? 30, 20 years ago when we were young or somebody decided for us and put us in that career track or that mentality? We have to move from me to we, cooperate, collaborate, dialogue these days, or perish, including all the fauna and flora, what we call the environment, which is so hurting, out of balance, and even endangered. So many species going becoming extinct every day and more every year. So many thousands of acres of forest, of rainforest being decimated, being burnt down. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Joni Mitchell sang way back in the 60s. We have a lot of concrete cam canyons, a lot of bright macadam in the blazing sun. What are we tending to our gardens, the garden of this earth? the garden of our bodies, the garden of our families, the garden of our relations, the garden of our soul. The soul isn't the favorite, favorite word in Buddhism. Buddhism talks about anatma, no separate independent permanent self, anatma. That was part of Buddha's reform. Buddha was a Hindu. Hinduism is much older. The relationship is somewhat like Judaism, which is old, Old Testament and old, three, four millennia old, and Christianity, which came along 2000 years ago with the New Testament and all. So Buddhism, Buddha was a Hindu. He found that there was no permanent, independent, eternal soul or Atma, according to his enlightenment, his Buddha vision, his cosmic awareness. And that's something for us to look into. Well, we're not, we're highly partisan, at least we're somewhat egotistical. It's hard to find anybody that isn't somewhat selfish, but in moderation, it's manageable. But partisanship can only get you so far. We all have a lot more in common as human beings and living here on this continent than different. And as I always say, if we don't Pulled together will be pulled apart. What did Al Gore say at the end of his movie about the environment, Inconvenient Truth? The African saying is, if you want to go quick, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I like that, especially on the spiritual path, which is definitely an infinite journey, not just a quick fix, not just a perhaps drug induced or psychotic break up and down like a yo-yo or a roller coaster, which is fun, but not necessarily every day and every night. It's certainly not fun if it's out of control, if too much out of control. Not that we're the ultimate control freaks, but the middle way is the way. Letting go and self-mastery. Living the mindful, attentive, conscious life, not sleepwalking semi-consciously days through life, having all kinds of so-called accidents. So let's do a little practice. I'll do a little guided. I'm trying to leave some room for Q&A today. There's a lot we could talk about. I'm thinking about what's going on with the pandemic and the world. Kids going back to school, people going back to work or to restaurants, a certain segment being vaccinated and how that's gonna affect things, the CDC suggestions for us and so on. There's a lot going on today. So let's step off the treadmill, the gerbil cage, the windmill of our ivory tower of our head and breathe and relax and smile and come down into our heart, into our solar plexus, into our belly, into our navel chakra, grounded, groundless, get grounded. 
Thich Nhat Hanh dares, dares to say solid like a mountain. It's not something you hear much from meditation teachers, solid. I like that. You mean balanced like a tripod, not just swaying like a pole in the, in the wind or grass. Come down from the arid desert of the intellect, useful in its own way, into the oasis of the heart of the solar plexus of the navel chakra. The pure sensation, unmediated by thought, concept, and labeling. This moment, only moment, this breath, only breath, this sensation or feeling, only sensation, embodied dharma, tuku, namanakaya, divine form on earth, not abstract principle, invisible formless dharmakaya, the ultimate higher power archetype, but embodied on earth like Buddha, like Jesus, like Padmasambhava, like Machi Glabdran. Somebody asked me about Pema Chudran and Tara Brock yesterday. Yes, like them too, why not? We love our American teachers and bodhisattvas. Embodied here and now, present and accountable. Assume your Buddha seat, your Buddha stance, Mahamudra, the ultimate stance, the great perspective. Maha, beyond big and small, it means great, vast. And mudra, gesture, hand gestures, or the gesture of awareness, what position your mind takes. Chunk Rinpoche boldly translated it as the great symbol. And when somebody said, what is it a symbol of? He brilliantly, Chunk Rinpoche, the great Buddhist pioneer, he said, symbolic of itself. Whoa. That's non-dual teaching for you. Everything is it, the great symbol, not symbolizing something else to come later or invisible. Anyway, those who have ears to hear, let them see. Be here now. It's not news, but it's the evergreen universal reality. The great European philosopher Kant had the word now under the glass on his wooden desk. And we don't think of him as a new age guy. The critique of pure reason and all that from Kant, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Kant, the great European philosopher. Now was his motto or reminder too. So assume your Buddha seat, your Buddha stance, the great symbol, symbolic of itself. Mind the mind. Gaze at the seer and be free. See through yourself and be free. Gaze. Awareness alone, awareness, aware of awareness and non-dual and compartmentalized wholeness and totality. Just sitting, just breathing, just being aware, attentive, present. The three pillars of natural meditation, just sitting, Nirmanakaya, just breathing, Sambhogakaya, just being, Dharmakaya, Imaho. Three in one, like three in one oil, like the Holy Trinity, visible, invisible, and the spirit in between, but the animating principle. In Buddhism, the higher power, the ultimate reliance or refuge, the triple gem. Natural body, natural breath and energy, natural heart mind, the three kayas, the three Buddha dimensions, visible, invisible, and energy or vision and experience in between. Open, empty, ungraspable, yet lucid, luminous, aware. What a mystery. It ain't something, but it ain't nothing, is it? It ain't nothing neither. <laughs> stop the mind, stop the world. <laughs> stop bothering your head and it'll bother you a lot less, I guarantee it. Or you get your money back for this town hall meeting.
<laughs> oh, enjoy the joy of unmeditation, undoing the habits of overdoing. Enjoy the joy of being, of being alive together. You're now co-meditating together, co, what do we call it, intermeditating together, interbeing together. From me to we, we can do it. We are doing it. We will continue together. How sweet it is. Love is greater than death. I'll interpret that as it goes beyond death. Amen. As the good book says. Death is just a chapter in our course, in our journey, in the cycle of life and death, coming and going, breathing in and breathing out. Like the universe also breathing in for a few million years or intergalactic time and breathing out. It will happen again. <sighs> Over the e eons, the yugas, as they call it in Sanskrit, the, the great kalpas or eons of time and space. As above, so below in the macrocosm, thus the microcosm, breathing in and breathing out includes it all. Let me remind you the basic instructions, especially if you're new here, if you don't have a regular daily meditation practice already. Natural body, just sitting, natural breath and energy, just breathing, natural flow, let it go, let it be. And third, natural mind, natural heart mind, just being present, attentive, aware, lucid, luminous, incandescently present, not just daydreaming or waiting for the the end of this meditation session. The three pillars of natural meditation, natural body, natural breath and energy, and third, natural heart, mind. Not visualizing, not chanting, not praying for something to happen, not radiating rays, not analyzing the nature of self and other. Just breathing in and breathing out. How natural is that? Nothing to convert to or convert from. Just breathing. Most of us don't breathe very well when you have have birthing lessons or yoga lessons, you find out there is a deeper breath one can breathe and a subtler energy, the prana, the chi, the life force, than just oxygenation and carbon dioxide expelled. Just sitting, just breathing, just awareing, awareful, mindful, attentive, incandescently present. Presencing, if you like. Now, in this awareness, the authentic, unfabricated within. Awareness, aware of aware, awareness. Letting go means letting come and go, friends. Letting be, that's the secret. Great equanimity. A spiritual detachment, caring that. Acts like grandparents watching the kids play, not just parents, but their investment of outcomes. Caring that spiritual detachment, seeing the bigger picture, not being over invested in responsibility and outcomes when you're not responsible. More like the grandparent watching the kids play than the parent. Don't bother your mind and it'll bother you a lot less. Just let it go. The popcorn machine, you don't need to butter it up. It'll settle up its own if you stop feeding it. And enjoy the buoyant joy of Dzogchen, of seeing through natural meditation. This breath on the breath, the holy now, the eternal instant. Imaho, Eureka, wondrous, hallelujah, swaha, yes. Ah, how sweet it is.
Ah, oh. oh, what a release, what a relief. Ah, oh, say ah oh, to yourself for Dr. Das. Ah, oh, no gaga for a moment. Ah, oh, that could be a Oh, let go of your serious self-improvement projects and agendas and just be, just being, just seeing. As Buddha said, in seeing, there's just seeing, nothing to see and nothing to look for, and no one's seeing it. In hearing, just hearing, nothing to listen for, no one hearing it. In other words, just pure process. Break it down to the mind moment, not just a minute, not just a second so many mind moments in one second the undercurrent of presence of awareness of the animating principle indescribable beingness aliveness consciousness awareness awareness with a capital a just being with a capital B plus, see? Openness and lucid awareness, inseparable, groundless, groundless, ultimate sphere of pure being, not just being a separate being, no partisanship here between outer and inner self or other, just things popping, arising, as we call it in technical terms, in meditation texts, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, moods, physical sensations arising, letting them go like ripples on the stream, stream of consciousness. Waves in the sea, sea of awareness. Like clouds flitting through the diamond like sky like nature of mind. Sky gazing, space mingling, infinite dissolving. Oh, how sweet it is. Simple, yet not always easy.
Now flick your eyes up and down a few times, just your eyes, not your head. With the upward glance, the lightning-like upward glance taught by the great Tirtan, the fifth Dalai Lama. To break up your mental formations. Breathe out, ah, relax. Ah. And now right, left, right, left a few times, not moving your head, just your eyeballs. Your glance, ah, from the Dzogchen Rusha, breaking up your mental formations. Ha ha hi hi ha ha hi ha ha hi ha hi ha hi. You can chant ha ha hi hi, the laughter of the Dakis and Dakinis, if you like, with this ha ha hi hi hi. Take you out of your rational thinking, ha ha hi hi. Little Dzogchen MDR from a thousand years ago, EMDR, ha ha hi hi ha hi ha hi. And then breathe out and drop everything on and sense who or what is experiencing. Rest at the origin of all things. Rely on the view, nothing more to do. Nowhere to go and no one knowing. Now let's go out singing and praying and joyful and radiating love and benevolence, well-wishing, loving kindness and compassion to all, joy to the world, chanting the female Buddha Tara's great compassion and liberating activity mantra. Om Tade, Tu Tade, Tude Swaha. Could we see that on the share board, please, Jeff? Om Tade Tu Tade Tude Swaha. This is, there are many different kinds of mantras or words of power or these short invocation prayers. It's called the name mantra where you exhort the deity or the archetype. You, you extol and exhort and call up the qualities personified by that archetype like loving kindness and compassion and liberating activity in the case of Tara, the female Buddha, the first responder to prayers, the mother of Tibet, the guardian of the high ground within the inner Tibet. When they go low, we stay high. 
Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Die Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Die Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Die Soha Om Tare Tu Dare to the so ha on tare to tare to the so ha on tare to tare to the play with it so ha on tare to tare to the so ha 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 ta re tu ta re tu ye so how holy mother tara bless us encourage us empower us inspire us to ta re tu ye don't be afraid to move don't be a wooden buddha so a living buddha is best um ta re tu ta re tu ye so ha om ta re tu ta re tu di e so ha ha ta re tu ta re tu di e so ha don't be self conscious this is a buddhist prayer no one's really listening om ta to tare to the so ha 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 um tare to tare to me up so ha um tare to tare to the so ha ha ta to tare to the so tara tare to tare to the yo tara so how tare to tare to the so ha um tare to tare to the so ha 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 tare to tare to the so ha tara which means star in Sanskrit a light guiding us home to tare to the so ha um tare to nare to the so ha tare to sacred hill in Ireland so ha to tare to the so ha ha scarlet yo hands uh, scarlet O'Hara's <laughs> Plantation and gone with the wind in Virginia or South Carolina. Om Tare to Tare to the So Ha Om Tare to Tare to the So Ha Om Tare to Tare to the so ha ha ta ha re tu ta re tu die so oh ha Amish to Tara. Mother of all the Buddhas, the womb of the effulgent, womb of emptiness, womb of enlightenment. Even more ho. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, holy tar, purify and transform us. Purify and transform all. May your liberating and healing Buddha activity come through us into this benighted world. 
Maybe we channels for it. Maybe we be conduits for it. May we take it up and carry it on and pay it forward. You're liberating the healing Buddha activity. Proactive Buddha activity, not reactive egocentric karmic activity. Proactive, spontaneous, liberating, selflessly motivated, compassionate Buddha activity. Maho. Jeff, could we see the dedication prayer? that we used yesterday from the 8th Karmapa Mikyodurje, please, to go out dedicating the merits, including dedicating the virtues and benefits of this practice to the enlightenment and healing and peace and fulfillment of all beings, not just keeping it for ourselves. By the virtue of this merit, may all sentient beings without exception, combining skillful means and wisdom and timeless happiness, may we all realize the indestructible, diamond-like Vajra mind and gain deathlessness. I dedicate these merits, the benefits of this virtuous practice, so that progressing on the inner path, on the indestructible Vajra way, the diamond way, the tantric mantric way, may they all attain perfect, unexcelled Buddhahood, awakening, awakefulness, enlightenment. This was uh, written or pronounced by the eighth Karmapalama Mikya Dorje, the indestructible Vajra. He was a great, great Lama. We're still practicing his guru yoga. I think it's called the Tunshi Lama Naljur, the four session guru yoga of Mikyur Dorje in the Karmakagyu tradition. In fact, he was the guru, or maybe Minjur Tuku Rinpoche was the guru of him in his previous incarnation, five centuries or four centuries ago. He was a great Lama. Today we have Minjur Tuku Rinpoche, who was his teacher or his student at that time, and is a reincarnation of one of my Dzogchen teachers, Kanju Rinpoche. So this lineage and these blessings, this wisdom tradition goes on. And we're part of it, aren't we fortunate? So let's use it, utilize it, take it in. Contemplate it, make it part of ourselves, experience it, realize it, pay it forward for the benefit of one and all. Pay back the kindness and generosity of our teachers, and all the hardship they went through to keep this alive in the exile from Tibet and so on, and over the centuries. Repay them by paying it forward selflessly, unattachedly, generously meaningfully, effectively, kindly, compassionately, not proselytizing, missionaryizing, but inviting people to the feasts to come and see, as Buddha said, at the end of all his teachings, ehi pasako, meaning come and see, help yourself. So now let's see um, the millennium prayer. By the virtue of this merit, I don't, uh, it, is it on the whiteboard? I can't see it, so I can't read it. I mean, I could say it in my own version. It's not on the whiteboard. One sec, Lama. Okay. Patience, Leo. I see that punam. Bob. I see you. Alan Mon. Who else is there? Lale. Judy. Okay. The new millennium prayer. May all expanded. Wow, these things just keep growing like weeds. May all beings everywhere with whom we are inseparably interconnected 
and to want the need the same as we do. May all be awakened, liberated, healed, fulfilled, and free. May there be peace and harmony in this world and an end to war and violence, inequality and oppression, greed and cruelty, pandemics, famine, droughts, earthquakes, all kinds of natural disasters. May we all be free from harm, fear, danger, anxiety, and insecurity. May we better prepare ourselves for the natural calamities that beset us all. And may we all together complete the spiritual journey. Yay! One beloved community, one circle, one sangha, one family, one samaya, one all the way om. Yes! So be it. Hallelujah and amen. Imaho. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Somehow it always seems irrelevant to talk after that chanting and praying and affirming and wishing and bodhichatka bodhichatka bodhisattva revving up. I remember one of my friends, uh, John Friedlander in Ann Arbor, Michigan, he had a cat named Bodhi Katfa and a dog named Bodhi Dogma. I thought that was pretty funny. Another personal story. At our now gone retreat center outside Austin, Texas, in the western foothills, Zogchen Oselling, the Zogchen Lighthouse. And we had 100 day retreats every autumn for a while, 15, 20 years ago. We built some cabins and we built some, you know, bathrooms and showers and outdoor facilities as well as indoor. And um, the men's bathroom was called Sam. And the, had a sign, Sam, and next to it was the women's bathroom door, which said Sarah. I thought that was pretty funny. That was an addition. That was a good, like, growth of the Buddha Dharma in, in the New World, don't you think? Some Sarah, you know, Sam, Sarah, shit house. <laughs> Okay, I'm just entertaining myself here. I'm getting paid by the minute, so I'm trying to stretch it out. <laughs> Not really. So um, instead of going on with my uh, jokey mind today, anybody have any questions or anything? Um, I have a question from Atticus. It's a two-parter. Can you hear me okay? I can only hear one part at a time. <laughs> okay, here's the first part. Um, you have described Zogen as swooping from above while we climb from below. And he wants to know that to swoop from above is a feat of spiritual materialism. No. Okay, second part. Des How did it? Desire is the key word there. So if you turn it into aspiration or, um, mm, you know, something like that. It sounds a little better. Like we have the aspiration to see the bigger picture while we're, you know, hacking through the jungle with our machetes on the gradual path and climbing the spiritual mountain, you know, and so on. Have the aspiration to see it from, you know, to not lose sight of the bigger picture while we're lost among the concrete canyons of the city, for example. But we have a sense of where the, you know, like in Manhattan, the rivers are in east and west and north and south from the grid, the boulevards and the streets. So it's not spiritual materialism. Of course, anything could be spiritual materialism if you have too much of a desire for it, including enlightenment, but no. And then the second part is how to distinguish between a materialistic and pure desire in our practice. Mm. Um, in our practice, not just in life, which is, of course, our real pra main practice, but in our practice, 
he says, hmm, Atticus. Uh, first, being very honest and candid with ourselves. If we're true seekers, if we're on this kind of a path, do we, is there really another choice? Self-deception is one of the biggest potholes or sidetracks on the way. So being very honest with ourselves. And of course, this is a subtle matter you're asking about. Materialism and motivation and intention. It's easier to, you know, I'm not advocating judging, but it's easier to evaluate or judge or see behavior, you know, action than it is intention. And the road to hell is said to be paved with good intentions. On the other hand, intention is very, very important, sometimes more than action. Anyway, they go together. That's why there's crimes in the first degree or second degree or involuntary, you know, something, manslaughter, whatever. Not that that's good, but if the plane you're in hits a flock of birds, you don't have the same karma of killing as if you swat a mosquito in a fit of peak you have the mindset of peak irritation anger hatred you know violence which might which like reinforces that to happen again well with the accident in the sky your passenger you know you're sleeping or you're watching the food source he didn't say it that assertively but that he, he explained that about karma so I think it's very important to look at the behavior, outerly, action, the intention, innerly, and then even deeper, invisible or the mystical or the, you know, one, is it in the core? Is it aligned or not? Where is it coming from? What's the goal, et cetera? Like you might be hungry, irritable, and angry about it. Well, you might be fasting, praying to take on the suffering of all those who are hungry and gathered into you so they have a food, all the food and opportunities you have, like through the exchanging self and others, practice and tongue. So it depends very much on the goal, the aspiration, the inner intention and motivation and so on. Thinking about, but I mean, I could think of examples, but you know, you should ask. Like if you're just trying to get high or blissful in meditation, that's kind of materialistic. It's more like sensual materialism, but it, you know, it's like spiritual sensuality or something, which is not Tantra. Respecting the body as a temple is Tantra. Just trying to be high all the time by hyperventilating and calling it yoga breathing is not yoga or Tantra. So you have to be very honest with yourself and pay attention as always, attention is the essence. You could also ask your mate or kindred spirits walking on the path with you about how they deal with it or what they think of your practice or experiences. Well, you could ask your you know, instructor, your teacher, like you asked me. So this is my thinking. Good to check ourselves and see if the practices, you know, if it's the best practices for us. And if we're doing them right, you know, right enough. If we know what we're doing, not hurting ourselves, you know, like warming up before exercise is important. Sometimes you have to learn that from someone. When you're a kid, you don't know that. I was a baseball pitcher. I used to throw my arm out the first few times I threw a ball in the spring. Then my neighbor's father taught me to throw snowballs and keep my arm in shape and warm it up. And then, you know, warm up with the balls before I started to throw hard in the spring. So like teacher, mentor, elder, kindred spirit on the way. Not a major leaguer, not the greatest pitcher ever. I didn't need the Dalai Lama pitchers to explain that to me. It was very, very helpful. So thank you for your question. Good question. And spiritual materialism is a big issue. I'm not going to explain it, try to explain it now. Trungpa Rinpoche, the great Buddhist pioneer, has a whole book on it called Spiritual Materialism from the 70s or 80s. 
It's worth reading. It's one of his best books. Check it out. Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, it's called. Questions, please. Lama, we're out of time now. Um, so I would like to encourage you to look at the chat and see our upcoming programs. We have um, in April, we have uh, the last masterclass on the 17th. So if you have uh, questions that don't get answered, you might want to sign up. It's a small, it's a group. And uh, sign up, and that launch. 